The Fresh Fiction Podcast is brought to you by Ravel and Bethany House Books, publishers of the new book Together Forever by Jody Headland. My name is Gwen Reyes, and I am ready to travel back in time for today's episode. I'm also really excited because we are talking with Jody Headland about Together Forever. Jody, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me, Gwen. So, Jody, um, go ahead and tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, like many writers, I was born with a pen in my hand, I think. (laughs) (laughs) I filled notebooks with stories when I was growing up, and really my mom was the most influential person in my writing career, and I always like to say that as an encouragement for um, moms with aspiring authors that They have so much influence over their children. But my mom uh, really did help facilitate my love of writing by reading aloud to me and giving me good books to read and just really providing a home environment that fostered my creativity. In fact, we didn't have a TV for a number of years while I was growing up, so that that seems kind of strange now, but she um, she just really believed in me and encouraged me to pursue my dreams and always was there writing alongside of me cheering me on, and in fact, still is. Um, but my passion for writing really followed me into adulthood, and I wanted to be a writer, but like most aspiring writers, I had no idea uh, what, co- what career to major in. Right, and yeah. I I knew I'd need a career to pay the bills, but uh, while I worked on my novels, but I I really didn't know what. Uh, As as life had it, I ended up majoring in social work and went on and even got my master's in social work at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And during all that time, I just kept on writing and learning about writing and before I had kids, I, I even managed to squeeze in about five different books wow. <laughs> that I wrote. Yeah. So um, those were my early practice books that are in the closet and will never see the light of day. Oh, you don't think so? <laughs> they were really the stepping stones in uh, my education as a writer. And so I, I don't look at at them as wasted attempts at all. I know a lot of writers will will tend to get discouraged after the first book or two and think, am I ever going to be good enough? But I really encourage writers to continue pressing on and, and, and not to give up, uh, even after five books, <laughs> like I did. Um, but uh, I, I ended up taking a, a pretty long writing hiatus. I had twins. And, and a two-year-old, and at the time, it was just overwhelming for me to be able to write and work. And so I took about seven years completely off from writing. But during those seven years, I know that all of that was just simmering, like a pot on the back of your stove. And, and my life experiences were making me richer and, and ready and just adding all the spices and ingredients necessary to then make me a better writer when I came back Mm -hmm. from that break. And so, um, when my, I had five children (laughs) and after my fifth was born, I ended up, um, starting to write again. And I wrote during my children's nap time and after they went to bed at night and that, first book that I wrote after I came back was my first published book. So um, I I think that, like I said before, all of that kind of prepared me to be ready for publication and becoming an author. And since that time, I've gone on to write over 20 books. And Together Forever, I think, is mm, probably... 18 or 19 in that in that list Mm -hmm. so (laughs) um yeah so that's kind of a in a nutshell that bringing you up to date for where I'm at now that's so so it's interesting to me because I hear from a lot of authors who have taken like their hiatus and then they'll come back and write while their children are sleeping and everything but Mm -hmm. that they don't tend to publish that first book and for you while you were right while you were writing it how was that experience when you when you finished it, it was ready to be published, and then you got it in your hands that first time? Wow, there's nothing um, more exciting mm-hmm. for an author who's been writing for literally years and has dreamed about it since she was a little girl to finally have that book in your hands. That is 
the culmination of a lifetime of dreams, but also on the flip side, a real eye opener that, um, that that is not the ending point either. It's right. just the beginning of a lot of, lot of hard work <laughs> in making it a career these days, because honestly being a career author in this in this climate is a very very challenging thing and so i i didn't realize that at the time but um it it, it's simply it's simply the beginning of of even more hard work yeah for sure what have been some what were some of the challenges you saw after you know finishing that first one and then jumping into your second book and also i'm very interested to hear about your um experience of of being still being a career writer now and the challenges that you still see in the industry well you know over the last 10 or so years since i've been publishing the landscape has changed immensely when my first book released, ebooks were just babies mm -hmm. and just coming out, and self publishing was not a, a huge thing. And those who did self publish were stigmatized. And so uh, it wasn't really on the radar. And everyone at that point, when I was first publishing, had to get an agent and had to go the traditional route. And it was a big accomplishment to get an agent and go that route. And, and it still is, I think, but there's so many more options that have opened up um, over the past um, 10 years that we couldn't even imagine. Right. And so as I've gone down my publishing journey, I have also branched into some indie publishing as well as as well as continuing with my traditional publishing. So it's been kind of fun to explore both mm -hmm. and have that option available that if I want to write a certain book that my publisher isn't really interested in publishing, I can still do it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's been really fun and, and freeing. But I do see but de definitely the benefits of having gone the traditional route and continuing to do that route um, as far as um, the land, like I said, the landscape has really changed. There are so many, many, many people publishing and striving to get their books noticed that it is very tough for a de debut author nowadays, um, whether they self-publish or go the traditional route to get noticed. And so I think that um, there just there's there's so many obstacles, and having a traditional publisher kind of back you up can be one advantage um, nowadays. It, it getting your name out there, um, I, I found that having multiple books releasing a year is also um, an important strategy. Um, as well as having, I, I also found that having a couple of free novellas or perm free books has also been very helpful. So I think there are a lot of strategies that can work. Um, it's just a matter of figuring them out and yeah. what works for each author. For and sure. I know I know on the reader side, we're very selfish and we love to have as much content as we possibly can from our authors. And it's very hard for us sometimes to uh, to accept that, you know, it takes a very long time for an author to finish a book. And we're like, mm -hmm. why can't we have it right now? We finished reading it last night. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yep. So I'm curious because with um, with Together Forever, it's the second in your Orphan Train series, and um, there was another book that I saw that you wrote that was like a, a retelling of Robin Hood that I was so fascinated by. But historical fiction, has this always been the love for you? Is this where you thought your voice was the best fit? Well, interestingly, as I mentioned, I have those practice books that are in the closet that won't ever see the light of day. Mm -hmm. Those are actually the contemporary. So I, I didn't ever really start off thinking I would write historicals. Uh, but as I have grown personally and fallen in love with history and uh, have done lots and lots of research, that is definitely where my passion lies now uh, I have kind of gone all over the board with the his mm -hmm. with my historical so I have some as you said the Robin Hood one that is set in medieval times and I have and that is part of a young adult series that I've written that uh, I, I was able to uh, publish with Zondervan um, and then as I mentioned 
I have just recently branched into continuing that series independently with a few of my own books that oh, I published. Yeah. Uh, but then I've also done um, books um, that are um, set in the early 1800s, some in colonial times, and then with my most recent series with Bethany House, I have um, done this orphan train series, which is set in the 1850s. So I, I really covered all time periods. I'm not an expert in any single one of them, but I, I love being able to do research and kind of delve into different era, eras and different um, different problems, I guess you could say, yeah. that our country has experienced. And that's the thing that I, um, that's one of the things I love about historical fiction in general is that it's, it's such a great way for contemporary readers to recognize that some of the things that we experience now have been problems that people have had in other world and other times mm-hmm. in our country and then also just in life. Um, right. And I, I, I had no idea about this. I had no idea about this idea of the Children's Aid Society or these groups of people that would take kids across the country on trains and drop them at different train um, uh, train cities. And how did you discover that? Because this is the second in that series. But um, right. yeah, I'm just so fascinated because I'd never heard of that before. Oh, for sure. Me too. I, I've, I've actually been fascinated with that era for quite a while. Um, I had read um, Christina Klein's Orphan Train book that was a bestseller and had read many, you know, children's Orphan Train books while I was growing up. And it just, it has always tugged on my heart. Mm -hmm. They're just heart-wrenching stories of these homeless and helpless young orphans who ran the streets of New York City. And it was such, the immigration uh, policies at the time and the number of immigrants coming into New York City was absolutely staggering and and the jobs and the housing markets just could not keep up with the people who lived there and there was there were diseases and and just lots of social problems and so you you have this massive amount of of children roaming the streets and like you said the children's aid society was formed by charles loring grace to address that problem he was just a a simple minister who saw these these children and wanted to help them in some way and so he decided that the country versus the city would be a more wholesome place and healthy environment for these children and so he decided to start this movement where he would gather up homeless children and take them out into the country and attempt to place them with various um, homes so that they could actually have homes Mm -hmm. (laughs) and food but not only that but have um, an experience in the country that he thought would be more wholesome and happy and a better place for these children to be raised. And so whether or not we completely agree with all of his methods or not, his intention was really to help the children. And of course, there were there were definitely problems that arose within this movement. And I try and touch on some of that um, in my books. But what happened was, as I was trying to decide how to lay out this, this series, I didn't want each each of the books to be um, a duplication of the same type of story. So I decided to have each book kind of touch on a different aspect of the orphan train movement. So the very first book in this series addresses the problem of some of the women in New York City at the time who were, uh, there was a panic, basically a financial panic that happened. And so the Children's Aid Society um, decided to have a uh, female Im- orphan train, if you want to say, mm-hmm. <laughs> where these, these young women who were out of work, they could save them from a life of prostitution because basically that was Their really the main source of women, yeah. you know, main source of income. Yeah. And so they wanted to save the women, and so they started up um, a movement. And it lasted probably about six months to a year. And they they sent women to job markets in 
in the Midwest and helped provide jobs for them. So my first book is all about that. And then the second book, Together Forever, is takes the perspective of one of the placing agents, one of the men and many men and women who helped take the orphans on the trains and put them in homes. And so I try to give the perspective of someone, um, a woman and a man who were riding the train with the orphans and what it might have been like for them to form relationships with the children and then have to actually let go of them and place them in these homes with people they didn't know and that's how it really was and again it wasn't an ideal situation but these these people had good hearts and wanted to do what was best for the children and and so the second book is all about that focus of those placing agents who um take the children and at various towns along the railroad stop and form meetings where people within the community come and look at the children and decide if they want to take one home with them. (laughs) It's kind of like modern day version of a a rescue society for puppies. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. The agents would then try and place all the children, and then on their way back home, back to New York, they would stop at each of the towns and do follow-up visits okay. and um, attempt to see how this, how how the placements were working. And obviously, the record keeping was not great, and and they had like you know you foster care today is so much more complex Mm -hmm. and you know there are the all all of these hoops that foster parents have to jump through to become a foster parent which is good but none of that existed and you know they they hardly knew the people and really had to um, use the recommendations of placing committees who were formed as to whether or not these were good families that were actually taking the children home so it was it was it was just a really interesting and um, difficult time, but again, it was in an effort to help these children get them off the streets and provide um, homes and food for them. And as as bad as some of the situations were, there were some very happy endings as well, yeah. good and bad. And then the, you know, and then with that, within Together Forever, we also have our main character, Mary Ann, who is searching for her her younger sister who's gone missing. And, and I'm sure, like, with her, like, a lot of these goals of doing good is really just in the name of her sister and, and the mm-hmm. hope that they can be reunited. Right. Right, yes. In, in the first book, um, the three sisters are together for part of the beginning of the book and so you do get to meet all three and the oldest sister Elise is one of the sisters who goes west with the group of women to be a part of the she's unemployed and she's looking for work and she's trying to support her two younger sisters well the youngest sister ends up running away and so Marianne in Together Forever feels really guilty about that. Like she was the one who was responsible for her younger sister. Mm-hmm. And so she runs away and she's she just feels really burdened to try and find her. And, and this guilt just kind of stays with her the entire book until the end when she um, begins to reconcile that, you know, you know, you can't control everything. And, and even if you do make mistakes, that that's OK. You know, you your life isn't defined by that and so obviously the third book (laughs) which releases in december is about that youngest sister's story and um it then i took the perspective of an orphan uh, for her story so she'll be riding an orphan train and it will be from her perspective and a couple of a few other of the orphans on the train with her so um each book uh will will definitely showcase the different aspects of the, the orphan train movement and culminating in the very last one from an orphan <laughs> herself. Cool. So, yeah. So That's hopefully cool. readers will be able to get up a very wide view of, of that whole movement and um, really be able to understand all of the different emotions, both good and bad and scary and, and, and 
delightful that came from that. For sure. Well, and the mm-hmm. great thing is too, with, um, with this one having been out already since the beginning of May, have you been hearing back from, uh, readers about their thoughts and, and how much they've enjoyed together forever? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just really a pleasure to hear from readers. They have have just been so enjoying this series. I, I think it's just the idea of Orphan Trains itself that is so nostalgic for for people and so fascinating. And so I really, I've been hearing from so many readers who are like, oh, this is my favorite of your series. I've liked them all, but this is the best one yet. And so that is really rewarding to hear because this is such an important concept. I mean, we're still dealing with this concept of children who need homes and maybe not in the same way that we once did, but we still have um, so many children today who are suffering. And so I think that if we can all, uh, my hope is that, um, that we can all be moved to do our part in whatever way that is. Um, maybe it's not being a foster care parent, but there are still lots of other ways that we can all be helping and, and doing our part to bring about better conditions for our homeless and helpless children. Yeah. My, um, I have a very good friend who lives up in Portland and he, uh, is, was the foster parent to two boys and they, he and his husband just recently were able to adopt them. And it was such a great experience for them because, you know, it's the up and downs of the foster system, but they get to give these two boys a wonderful life that they would never have had because of the circumstances that they were both born into. And, and it's Mm -hmm. always such a blessing and wonderful to see people who love children having that opportunity to take care of them. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. That's encouraging to hear. Yeah. It's, it's, I love their story. I'm always very, I consider those boys sort of my, like my godchildren because I just love yeah. getting to see them grow up and it's really cool. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, speaking of readers, um, I'm curious to know, uh, one of the things we like to do with the podcast is we love to talk about what we're watching, what we're reading and what we're listening to for our listeners to get some new recommendations. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, what, what are you currently watching, reading and listening to? Well, I am watching, uh, I'll start with that. Okay. I'm watching this is us. And so that is uh, I, I'm watching it with my college age daughters and we're on season two. And so speaking of faster <laughs> care, um, I don't know if you're watching the show or not, but they are one of the characters in the show is actually become a foster care parent. Right. Yeah. And, um, has brought in a young girl. And so it's been fascinating to just kind of be in that, um, in that show to watch that unfold and what, all the emotions for them and, and the, the difficulties as well as the small victories that they have with that young girl that they're fostering. So that that's what I've been watching. Boy, it's just been um, an interesting show to watch as far as the character development and um, just the depth of backstory that that the, that is brought in so that you're constantly seeing the present but then also the past and why everyone is the way they are in the present. So as a writer, that's really been an interesting process to watch and, and, and just kind of to analyze that whole, dy- all of the dynamics of, of that show. So that's what I'm watching. <laughs> and I'm sure you're um, watching it with like a box of Kleenexes as well. Oh, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I am. So it, it's just funny. I'll, I'll I'll try not to cry so my daughters don't wonder what's wrong with me. But I'm probably much more moved by the show on a deeper level just because of all of my own life experiences than they are. But, um, but yeah, so that's, that's what's number one, um, on our, our, our TV viewing for the summer. Um, as far as what I'm reading, um, I, have just finished uh, Susan Meissner's um, As Bright as Heaven, which was a very interesting book about the Spanish flu epidemic in Philadelphia in the early part of our or of the early 1900s. was very good. I, I just finished that. Um, I have 
Also, a few more books on my to-be-read list. Um, I have a couple by Daisy Goodwin, Victoria, and The American Heiress. And um, so I, I have usually have several books going at once, and I'm always reading and, and just voracious about it, actually, <laughs> um, in all my free time, right? <laughs> right, I was going to say, it's probably, uh, yeah. and it's interesting that you read historical and write historical as well. Mm -hmm. I actually read a lot of contemporary, too. Um, I, 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 I love reading YA um, just because that's where my kids are at. And so I usually have, um, a couple of YA going and then, um, I, I read contemporary, I read a lot of contemporary romance. It's harder for me to read historical romance since that's what I write. Mm -hmm. The, the historical that I read generally aren't historical romance, if that makes sense. Yeah. They're, they're more straight historical. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and I also, what I'm listening to, uh, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. And so um, that is where I get a lot of my reading time in. I, I usually have a couple of audiobooks going at the same time, um, podcasts, just um, make very good use of all of my time. I, I run every day, so I listen to something while I run, if I'm cooking dinner, um, running kids on errands <laughs> <laughs> around town to their activities. I, I always have something going. So I make very good use of my time, and I love that I can just take a book wherever I want to, wherever I want and can listen to it wherever I'm going. I do, so, too. Yeah, it's my mm -hmm. one of my favorite things. As soon as I got into audiobooks, it was like the whole the world like opened up for me. <laughs> Absolutely. Same here i just love it and I, I encourage readers all the time to take advantage of that because it's just i think we we've, we've kind of with our digital age we have that capability i mean just so easy to have the audible app or whatever you know audio program people prefer and to have it right there at our fingertips mm -hmm. there's really no need for cds or going to the library it's just a quick download with the touch of a finger now so yeah so that's awesome. that's yep mm -hmm. well um jody we're our time is almost up this was so much fun but i am curious yeah. for our listeners how can readers find out more about you and stay in touch with you sure i love hearing from readers uh i hang out a lot on Facebook. I have an author Facebook page. It's author Jody Hudland. And I'm also on Twitter under the same handle, Jody Hudland. And of course, I have a contact form on my website at jodyhudland.com. Um, that's primarily my main base. If you, if readers want to check out my books, um, check out uh, my blog, I have a couple of blogs that I'm a part of, and and then I'm also on Instagram. I I post mostly pictures of my pets <laughs> and, and my kids there, but but it's it's all. But good. you're there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, that's great. Yeah. Well, well, Jody, thank you so much. This was so much fun talking with you. Yeah. Um, I really thank really so appreciate it, too. and I hope mm -hmm. that you have. Um, a great rest of your summer. And like Jody said, you can find her on her website as well as um, visit freshfiction.com to get more information. And Together Forever is available now anywhere books are sold online and in stores. Thank you so much, Jody. Thank you. Thank you so much to Ravel Books and Bethany House for their continued support of the podcast. Make sure you stop by freshfiction.com to find out more about Jody Hedlund and other Ravel Books and Bethany House authors. Hey guys, we're still growing, so please help us out by subscribing and rating in the podcast, leaving a comment, or even just sharing it on social media. You can find us on Twitter at Fresh Fiction, Instagram as Fresh Fiction, and on Facebook. Until next time, happy reading.